everyone. Welcome back to What the Flight Radio, a podcast for in-flight crew, frequent flyers, and anyone that gives a (laughs) about aviation travel. Happy What the Flight Wednesdays, fam. So happy to be here with you once again. Thanks for tuning into the show. I'm your host, Jess V. And as a reminder, I need to let you know that this podcast is proudly brought to you in part by Living by the Upward. If you're an upward lover and you enjoy flying, festivals, fashion, fine art, fitness, food, or you live your life with a fulfill it yourself mentality, then you are in the right place. Please consider being my friend on social media at WT Flight Radio on all social media accounts or at Living by the F Word, which is my brand account. I would love to be your friend. I would love to hear from you. And I really appreciate you tuning in once again. In today's episode, we are going to be continuing my story time of my most memorable layovers. So if you missed that episode last week, episode three, go check it out first, because this is actually part two of that episode. And basically what happened was the episode just got way too long. I actually thought that I wouldn't have enough to fill the episode up, but I was way off with that. So yeah, go check it out if you missed it. I talk about why I wanted to have this topic as an episode and I talk about some really amazing layovers of mine from Yellowstone National Park to a real life Cinderella castle to thrift shopping in Reno and the craziest thing that I've ever done to attend a festival which also doubles as one of the craziest things I've ever done on a layover and that is attend Bonnaroo. (laughs) So yeah I don't know too many people that have attended one of the largest multi-genre well-known music festivals on a layover, but your girl is that level of crazy. So today, before the episode takes flight, of course, it is extremely important that you receive a safety briefing about the rules and regulations of this podcast. Please fasten your seatbelt in case we hit unexpected turbulence. I mean topics. After all, we are flying freely around the World Wide Web from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. And while it's very unlikely, it still is possible that we may leave smooth air. So for your safety and the safety of all listeners, please ensure that you have checked your attitude with your extra luggage. (laughs) Now, with that being said, in all seriousness, thanks once again for tuning in. Absolutely loving the feedback from all of you on the show, and I really appreciate you all being here. We have a wheels up time in just a few minutes, but before we take off, I would like to ask that if you do enjoy today's episode, please consider sharing it with your friends, get it out there, share it to your stories on Instagram, tweet it up, fam, tag me so I could reshare it. You know the drill. Make sure you give it a rating and review on Apple Podcasts if you're being feeling extra, extra generous. That would really help me out. And if you're flight crew, of course, you know what to do. Share this episode like you would share drama on the jump seat. You know what to do, fam. I know you all have big mouths out there. (laughs) Uh, I mean, this in like the nicest way possible. Anyone that's a crew member understands what I'm saying. You know what I mean. So yeah, shout out to all the flight crew out there. Uh, Really appreciate all you guys, of course. And a special shout out to all of you supporting the show. Thank you once again. A lot of people have been reaching out to me. Like it just means so much to me. It really helps me a lot. And I appreciate your feedback. It's like, it's just like such a good feeling. So thank you so much. Once again, sharing means caring. So yeah, please share this with a flight attendant friend, a travel addict that you know. I would really appreciate it. Also, as a reminder from the last episode, so in case you missed it, I am opening up my email for my first ever listener submissions podcast. So basically, this is going to be about your most memorable layovers. I really want to honor the listeners layovers as well, because when I was coming up with the concept of this episode, I thought, wow, you know what? Like, I I have great stories. I bet all my listeners have just as amazing stories or have traveled to different places or have some type of memory with someone somewhere. And I would love for you guys to share that with me so that I could share it with all the other listeners. So basically, um, if you are flight crew, 
if you want, you can tell me where you're based and you can tell me how many years of service you have. Uh, if your story is a little juicy, you know, you know what I mean? I know you have some juicy stories out there. Then you don't have to do that. You can remain anonymous. Just let me know in the email. And as far as my frequent flyers out there, if you're not flight crew, you, of course, can still submit as well. I want everyone to be included in this. So if you are a fellow travel addict and you have a crazy story or some type of memorable layover at a stopover or you know, you did something when you were on like a layover for just one night in a in a city, please feel free to submit those stories as well. Uh, so yeah, you can submit those to my email, which is radio at living by the com. Once again, submit all of your stories to radio at living by the com. If you want to title the subject line most memorable layover, or listener, most memorable layover, that would really help out. So I could figure out how to label that and keep it all organized. So yeah, I'm really excited to share all your, your stories. So I hope I get a lot of submissions and we can do that. All right. And lastly, before we dive into the episode, I want to give you this week's aviation lingo, which is pairing. So a pairing is essentially a flight attendant or pilot trip And the pairing is usually coded so that schedulers can keep track of who is on the trip, but it also gives us, the flight crew, information as well. So for example, each pairing with my company, for instance, starts with a letter, and that letter signifies where the trip is originating from. So it basically tells you where that crew member or where that base crew is located and where the pairing is originating from. And then there's usually like a bunch of random numbers or letters after that, which kind of just like keeps it organized, that keeps the crew all in one pairing. Uh, And yeah, basically it tells us about our flights, our check-in time, our layover time, where we're staying on the layover, what crew we're working with for each flight. So for instance, we might have different pilots for one flight and then we switch aircraft and we have different pilots. It tells us the aircraft we are flying on. And yeah, it just basically has all the information for our trip. And so that is called a pairing. So yeah, that's basically Basically it, let's get into part two of my most memorable layovers. Okay, so up next I have, this is kind of like combo trips because they all kind of were like synchronized, if that makes sense. So I had one trip and the two layovers were Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and Portland, Oregon. Now, this story I've told before on my YouTube channel. I've told it in the YouTube video of how I got into Tarot, Oracle, and Lenormand cards. So this this is what this layover is pretty much about, is how I obtained my first Tarot deck. And also then shortly after the trip after that in Philadelphia, how I obtained a deck that my Nana had that I didn't know about. Okay. So it's kind of like a combo of two layovers here. So the first one was the Raleigh layover where I got to, was it Raleigh? Maybe I, the raw actually, no, I'm mixing it up. This is what happened. It was a Raleigh layover with the Philly layover. So that's what it was. So the Portland layover was all by itself. And that's where I got my first tarot deck. And it was at Powell's, which is America's largest used and new bookstore. And Powell's is color coded. So if you've ever not been there before, it basically is color coded by different uh, categories. So For instance, like the purple room is where I love to spend my time because it's all about spirituality, self-help, career, business, stuff like that. Then they have like another room which would be colored for children. Then they have another room colored for fiction. And it's like a three-level massive store that um, is, yeah, it's pretty much very, very large and it's amazing. You could spend all day in there and that's pretty much what I did. So I thrifted a little bit at Buffalo Exchange and then I went to Powell's and I pretty much spent all my time in there. And I 
was looking at their tarot decks. And so I became interested in tarot because I was at Envision Festival in Costa Rica and my friends, Jesse and Lindsay and Ruby, they had brought Oracle decks and Oracle's Oracle cards are a different system than tarot, just like Lenormand is another type of system. Uh, they're basically different card systems and you could kind of think of them as different language. Like they're all for card divination. They're all a tool to help you seek answers to a question you may have, but they all work differently, if that makes sense. Uh, I actually was just a guest on the Babs Life podcast and it's episode number 67 and we actually got into a deep dive of all of that. And so if you want to learn more about like tarot systems and stuff, you could go check out his podcast. I just talked about it for so long over there. So, uh, but basically just to give you a summary, like they're different card systems. Anyways, at Powell's, they have this giant case. It's like from floor to season, not floor to ceiling. I'm God, I'm being so like exaggerating, but I mean, that's what makes stories good. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, it's this huge, case that has tarot and oracle decks and lenormand decks in there uh, i of course at the time didn't really know what the difference was i just knew that i wanted a tarot deck because when i was at envision festival and i got into cards because of my friends i just thought how powerful they were because my friend jesse kept pulling the same card so we would shuffle the cards every day and we would each pull a card to like reflect on for that day and she kept pulling the same card and it was the card that was called ruby i think but it was just very powerful because i was like yo this is like really weird that every single day you are pulling the same card like it's clearly like a message that you're supposed to be having right now you know so I was very intrigued by it. And as a fine arts major, like the art of all these cards and the art that people put into these decks is just absolutely gorgeous and insane. And so like, I was like, I need to get my own deck, but I didn't know like how to go about getting one. And then there's all these rumors with tarot cards that you should be gifted a, a deck and you should not buy your own deck and you shouldn't buy a deck online and the deck should pick you. And it's all a bunch of bullshit. Basically you can order decks online, but like at the time I didn't know. So I was like, let me look at these tarot decks and see if one picks me quote unquote. So you couldn't see what the cards were of course. And this case was full. I mean, they just have decks upon decks upon decks, you know, stacked on top of one another but what they do have is at the little information desk there they have a binder which has the different decks that they have and they have the cards printed on there so that you could kind of flip through to get a, a gist of what they look like so I was like flipping through this binder and writing down ones that stood out to me and then I came across this deck where I was uncontrollably smiling like you guys, I can't even explain it. It was like a surge of energy, like went into my body and I could not stop smiling. Like I was like, wow, like these cards are amazing. And they weren't even the cards in front of me. Like it was just like a print of the cards in a binder. And I just knew I was like, I have to get this deck. So I got this deck that is by Caitlin Keegan. It's called the Illuminated Tarot. And that was the first tarot deck I ever got. And I have about 20 tarot decks now. I have about probably eight Oracle decks. I have three Lenormand decks. I actually have a whole series on my YouTube channel called Fools for Tarot, which is all about tarot, Oracle, and Lenormand card divination. And I do unboxings to show my deck and talk about the cards. And I've done pick a card readings on my channel too. I just absolutely love, I just love these cards. They became such a big part of my life. But before I go off on a whole other tangent about that, let me try to stay focused here. So it was the Illuminated Tarot by Caitlin Keegan. And when I got home, I like looked at the guidebook and it was not that detailed. It was very like, very simplistic. So the art was very detailed. She's an illustrator from Brooklyn, very colorful. I absolutely obviously fell in love with the artwork. I was absolutely obsessed. And so that's why I picked it. But the guidebook was just very limited. Like it, it really didn't provide a lot for me to learn. So what ended up happening was I had to start researching things online. 
in order to learn the tarot. And as I was researching, I realized, oh, this isn't a standard tarot deck. Basically, the Illuminated Tarot is a 53-card deck, which can be used for divination, but typically most tarot decks are 78 cards. And within those 78 cards, there's five suits, basically. There's four regular suits that are kind of like the four suits of regular playing cards. And then there's another suit, which they call the Major Arcana, which is basically Arcana translates into life's mysteries. And the major cards are basically major life moments that happen, whereas the suits pertain to the four elements and different types of energies and people you may be experiencing or feeling. So, yeah, basically... What I realized was, okay, this isn't your standard deck because it's not 78 cards. So some of the cards within this deck that I had were combo meanings. So for instance, like the two of diamonds, which would be the two of pentacles in the tarot, was also the high priestess in this deck, if that makes sense. If you're familiar with tarot, like basically it was like one major card combined, card combined with a minor card. So... I was like, okay, like, uh, I still love it. I could still learn this way. I could just, you know, make it work. And I still, to this day, absolutely adore that deck. I have an unboxing on my YouTube channel. You can go check it out. But this is where things got, like, really fucking interesting. So basically what happened was I told my family I bought a tarot deck on this layover. And my mom and my uncle and my grandpa were like, oh, yeah, your Nana used to read tarot. I was like, what? Because my Nana had died in 2016. So this was like a 2017 layover. So she had like just recently died pretty much. Uh, Yeah. And I had no idea that she read cards. So it was really like shocking news to me. And I was kind of like, what? What do you mean she read cards? And my uncle was like, yeah, she, she stopped reading though. She felt like her cards turned on her. So I was like, whoa, this is like so crazy that this is happening right now. Like what? So (laughs) my grandpa said, I know where they are. I'll get them for you. And so sure enough, the next time he came over for dinner, he handed over the cards to me, which were in this little tiny box that kind of looked like a jewelry box like the way it opened was it would slide off the top so it wasn't like a tuck box a tuck box is where you know the top folds into the box so it was like a top a top that like pulls off of the top but the top was missing so I couldn't figure out what the deck was but not only that he handed them over to me and he was like I counted them they're all there and I was like oh I was like okay so you know that they're all there I was like they're 78 and he's like no there's 53. You guys, I literally lost my shit. I was like, what do you mean there's 53? Why are there 53? And all of them are there. Like, and I looked at them and they had these like playing card associations with them. And these were not tarot cards. Okay. I didn't know what they were because there was no cover, but they were not tarot cards. And so I was just like, what is going on? Like I got a tarot deck that's 53. My Nana has a deck of fortune telling cards or whatever they're called. Like, You know, they were calling them tarot cards, but I knew they weren't tarot cards. I was like, this is like, this is so insane. So anyway, basically, now I get the layover where the two layovers were Raleigh, North Carolina, and then it was Philadelphia. And my friend Lauren, if she's listening right now, she was on this trip with me and it was such a good trip. It was a good trip because she was with me, of course. I, I don't know if you remember. If she, I'm sure she's listening because she's been sharing this podcast for me. So I really appreciate it. But I don't know if you remember, but like starting off, like <laughs> we had to have maintenance come on, the, on, on board because some previous crew moved safety equipment, like very important safety equipment to, I guess, accommodate someone's bag or something. And so... I basically reported it because I was like, I am not touching this very important safety equipment that is supposed to be somewhere else and moving it and something happens. You know what I mean? So it was like all this drama where like we had maintenance come on and they were like, it's supposed to be on. And I was like, no shit, it's supposed to be on. It's just in the wrong place. Like I want you to move it. I do not want to be responsible for moving it anyway. (laughs) I don't know if if Lauren, if you're listening, if you remember that. Anyway, it was really funny. Well, not really, but... (laughs) It's funny now. Now that looking back on it, it's funny. But anyway, so we went to Raleigh and I went to, because I had gone to Powell's and got my first tarot deck, I also got a book that is called 
what the fuck is tarot and how do I do it? So that author of that book, What the Fuck is Tarot, that I got at Powell's, is based in Raleigh-Durham and has a shop called Everyday Magic. I don't know if she's still open now because of COVID. I honestly have no idea. But anyway, at the time, she has a shop called Everyday Magic that was in Raleigh-Durham. Well, obviously not in Raleigh and Durham. It was in one of the cities, but, you know, they're not too far apart. That's the airport. So... Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> wow, this one is going on like way longer than I thought it would. Sorry, you guys, but I hope it's entertaining. Anyways, here we go. So I wanted to go to her shop to get some crystals, but not only did I want to go to her shop to get crystals, I wanted her to sign my book, but unfortunately she wasn't there. But I did go to her shop and I got another tarot book, which is The Way of Tarot, which is by Alexander Jorda, Jor- Jor- uh, it's tongue tying right now. Jordan Weski, I believe it is, um, who has basically dedicated his life to studying tarot. But it was really good because I got some crystals and I got a new book about tarot and it just kind of started this entire tarot obsession that I had and still have and I absolutely love it. So after that, we went and we flew around wherever we had to fly to and then we laid over in Philly. And this was like one of the rare times where we had a downtown Philly layover and we were in a hotel that was very close to the Reading Market. Now, if anyone from Philly is tuning in, can you let me know, is the Reading Market still open? Because I know I remember seeing an article during COVID that it was going to be shut down which was absolutely devastating to me because the Reading Market is a very famous popular market in Philly that is all pretty much family-owned businesses. So I really hope it's still opened. Um, I really hope it is, but I'm not sure if it is. So anyway, Lauren and I decided let's go out, let's explore, let's go to the Reading Market. And the Reading Market basically has a lot of flowers, a lot of meats, a lot of foods, and Yeah, it basically just has things that uh, you can get like coffee or like things like food wise. But there was this one like metaphysical shop, which was kind of random. Like it was kind of like, okay, what are you doing here? But it had, you know, different types of herb bundles, candles, books, and it had decks there. So this is what was so crazy. I was standing there and I turned around and on the shelf was the imagery of my Nana's cards in a deck, but like in a updated deck. So basically the imagery on my Nana's cards is a witch with a cauldron and a cat. And that's what this box had. And it said the gypsy witch fortune telling cards. And I Honestly, you guys, it was just so crazy. Like all this that happened, like definitely go check out the video on my YouTube of how I got into tarot. I basically just retold the whole story here just in case you don't feel like doing that. But it was just so insane. It was just absolutely so cool that I found my Nana's deck because there was no instructions. And so I had no idea what type of deck it was. And so it basically was a fortune telling deck, which really is a Lenormand style card system, which I didn't realize until I got the instructions in the box of this deck. So that was like a super memorable layover. It kind of like was actually two separate trips, but it was all within like a week's time that it happened. I'm telling you, it was like so cool. It was so insane. And yeah, it was obviously very memorable as you could tell, because I just went on like a 20 minute storytelling time for that one. Whew, you guys, you guys, I like should have taken a sip of water before I turned my camera on again for anyone that's watching on YouTube. Should have taken a little break there. But here we go. We are on story number one, two, three, four, five, six. Layover six of ten. Oh my gosh. This really is going to be a longer episode. I I was so nervous that I wasn't going to be able to fill the time up with like just having bullet points, but clearly I am a talker, you guys. Clearly podcasting is for me. It is, you know, a way for me to just tell my stories and not worry about timing. So I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. But up next for this layover, we have another 2017 layover. And it was to London. And 
We actually didn't. I've been to London several times. I've had a bunch of London layovers, but we actually did not stay in London. But before I even get to why this was a memorable layover, who I was with and where we went and what happened, let me give you some backstory. So once again, I was on reserve. So it means you're on call. And I went out to output the night before, which if you're not a New York City or East Coast raver or someone from the East Coast that goes clubbing, then you might not know what output is. But it's unfortunately a club that is no longer. It had the best sound system and the best rooftop parties, but it's a club in New York City, in Brooklyn in particular. And Coco Drills, who are some of my favorite DJs. They're a DJ duo from Miami. I absolutely love them. They're Groove Cruise resident DJs, and I just love their sound. They're like a tech house DJ duo. Anyways, they were having a show at Output, and so I went, even though I was on call the next day. And I was out with a bunch of Groove Cruisers that are from the New York City region, and we were having a blast. And I like drove home at like 6 a.m. And actually, it was like, that night uh, before I had already gotten there, I realized I got assigned a standby assignment at the airport for noon. So I knew that I had work at noon, but I still stayed out until 6 a.m. Why would I do that? Oh my God. To this day, I'm like, I was, I just did like the craziest shit. And like, if you think about it, I was like, I don't know, five, four years younger. So like, I guess like also since I was new to the job, I really was just making the most of it. But I knew I was on call at noon, still stayed out till six, you know, came home. I slept until, you know, nine or 10 or whatever. And then I, so for four hours I slept, I got ready. I went to the airport and I pretty much was dead at the airport at noon. And at the time with our old contract, they could extend this standby assignment for six hours so of course like right off right as my time was supposed to like be up like it was like it used to be like a four-hour shift and if you don't know what standby is that's gonna have to be another aviation lingo segment but I'll just tell you real quick it basically is when you're like on call at the airport so instead of being on call at home on reserve you're on call at the airport and so you have to go and like pre-board planes and you have to you know you might be filling in for someone that like is late or didn't make it or if a crew like misconnects or something like that that's what like the standby reserves do so yeah I basically was absolutely dead and I was supposed to be done with my shift which was like at the time only four hours but then they extended it like right when I was supposed to go home they extended it to six hours and then right before that six hours was up I was assigned a trip to London you guys I (laughs) thought I was going to die. Literally, I was so tired. Oh my gosh. Because if you're not from like the East Coast or like you don't fly that much or like, or if you are a frequent flyer, then you know that all the East Coast flights that go over to Europe are basically like red eyes. Okay. They leave at night. They leave in the evening. They leave anywhere from like, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight PM. Sometimes even like the Tel Aviv's leave at like 11 p.m., whatever, they leave late and then you're flying for those six to nine hours overnight. And then when you get there, there's like a time change, usually like a five to six hour time change. And it's the middle of the morning already when you get there. So, (laughs) oh my God. So I remember I went down onto the plane and I was like literally livid because I really, I just wanted to get release to go home because I was tired because I was a dumbass and went to a Brooklyn club to party the night before being on call. So anyways, I was upset and my friend uh, Caroline was like on the plane already. So she had been assigned the trip and I like didn't realize or whatever. And I had flown with her before and I was like being like a grumpy little bitch about it I was like this sucks like I'm so tired you know stuff that was like my fault you know what I mean not like my job or scheduling's fault like it was my fault for doing that to myself but like I basically was like I can't believe it but like I guess like what I was upset about was the fact that I like was basically almost done to go home and then they extended it to the six hours and then I got assigned a trip that was then gonna (laughs) make me fly all night and so it was just it was just crazy but anyway 
she was like, oh, well, you know, Kate, who's our other friend, is working the other London flight. Because at the time, there there was like an early London flight trip that went out. And then there was like a late one. And so she was working the other one. She's like, we're going to go to Brighton. And I was like, oh, Brighton? And then like in my head, I was like, wait, how do I know Brighton? Like, that sounds so familiar. She's like, come on. You know what? She's like, I know that you're fun. I've worked with you before. Like, why are you being all grumpy? Come to Brighton with us. It's going to be so much fun. And then I realized that Brighton is where these two UK fashion designers that I love for festival fashion are based. And so I was like, whoa. I was like, yes. I was like, we have to go to Brighton. I have to go to Brighton. I was like, we have to go to their shops. Like, I have to get there. And so then I was like all about it. So anyway. We get over to London, we take the hour train ride down to Brighton, and we went to these girls' shops, and those girls are Betsky's Boutique and LOM Fashion. So if you are in the festival space, I'm sure you have heard me talk about these brands before, but Betsky's Boutique, she basically uh, makes clothing, but she is most well known for her fanny packs, very elaborate fanny packs, the best custom fanny packs you could ever have. I have a custom F word fanny pack by her. I have three fanny packs by her. And the first one I ever got was from this layover. I went to her shop. I remember when we found it and you had to like go upstairs and I was just like, Oh, and she was like, what is that? Who is that? And I was like, hi, My name is Jess. I'm from the United States. I'm here on a layover and I love your brand. I love your shop. I follow you on Instagram. I've been following you forever. This is so amazing. And she just was like completely like blown away that I was like even standing there like and she was like, what do you mean you're here for the day? This is crazy. So the whole concept of like just being a flight attendant and like there for just less than 24 hours. So anyway, I bought a fanny pack from her and then she called LOM, who is a very well-known fashion designer in the UK, very well-known for her bright colors, her bright prints, her fringe work, everything's gorgeous. And we went over to her shop and I bought a shirt from her that is now discontinued. And so like, not only that, like the girls I was with, Caroline and Kate, they just made the layover so fun. Like if you're if you've never been to Brighton before, it is such a quirky, fun city. It's very bright. It's very artsy. There is a house there. I have a picture in front of it that has the Death Star painted on it. Okay, I'm a huge Star Wars geek. So literally like this whole trip made my day and it's also on the water. So like there's stones that are on the water and we found a rock that said you are beautiful and the rocks are very small you know very very small so the whole day and then we went out to eat and we had some beers then the entire layover was absolutely amazing and I remember Caroline I remember Caroline was like you see I knew that you'd have fun (laughs) so that that to this day is still one of my favorite layovers and most memorable layovers as well. Okay, moving on to the next one, we have a Phoenix, Arizona layover. So as you could tell, like a lot of these are pretty domestic based um, because I was pretty much domestic based, but this was in 2018 and uh, I didn't stay in Phoenix. As you could tell, a lot of the layovers, I actually don't stay there. I end up driving somewhere. And so, yeah, this was one of those things. So my, one of my old time college best friends and sorority sisters, Ariel, was in Sedona. And I remember telling her that I got this Phoenix layover and to drive to Phoenix to come see me. She was there having this like major spiritual awakening and like she's one of those people that I constantly talk about because I went to Tomorrowland with her the first couple times. Well, the only two times that I went to Tomorrowland, which is a European electronic dance music festival in Belgium. Uh, She has done a complete 360 from who she was in college and at those festivals to where she is now. And it was because of her being in Sedona and it was because she got called to go to Sedona because 
she was seeing all these signs when she was living in Los Angeles and then she literally had a spiritual awakening in Sedona. So she was in Sedona and I knew that. And I was like, yo, Sedona is like a two hour drive to Phoenix. Come see me in Phoenix. I'm here for 19 hours. And I remember I got there and the next morning I woke up, it was like eight o'clock, nine o'clock. And I had a message from her or she called me and she was like, and I was like, are you here? And she was like, she's like, no, I'm in Sedona. And I was like, dude, I thought you were coming here to Phoenix. And she was like, Jess, she's like, you have to come here. She's like, trust me. She's like, you have to come here. And I was like, in my head, I was like, man, like, I only have 19 hours. I've already slept some of those hours away. You know what I mean? In my head, I was like, I don't really have that much time or whatever it was, you know? But I was like, all right. She basically convinced me. So I went to the rental car place. I rented a car for $35 and I drove the two hours to Sedona from Phoenix. And I remember driving in there and feeling like this emotional presence in me from just looking at the the rocks out there like it was crazy like it was so surreal like the feeling I was having and I was like whoa like that is like an intense energy and I met up with her and it honestly was just one of the best times because this was like my best friend that had done a complete life change transformational change from how she used to be to who she is now And I loved her both ways, but like she has just opened up and has like changed her life for the better. Like, like I I still am so proud of her. And so, um, it was just amazing. We went to a Thai food restaurant that she took me to and we took our tarot cards out. She had a deck. I had my deck and we had our crystals and we went to crystal shops and we went hiking and all this stuff like in a very short amount of time because I was there I probably got there around like 11 in the morning and then like I had to leave at night like I drove back at night um maybe the layover was longer than 19 hours maybe it was like a 24-hour layover I don't really remember but it was just so amazing being out there we didn't even go to any like the vortex point so like if you don't know about Sedona like it's basically a point in earth where they say that there's several points in earth where there's these spiritual vortexes and so to give you an example like the pyramids in Egypt are one of them but Sedona is another place and that has these vortexes and so there's just this very high presence of um, energy that comes from the earth and there's a lot of crystal and metaphysical shops there and there's a lot of yoga. There's just a lot of um, self-help retreat type feelings that you get and can experience there and very artsy. We went shopping like around all these, you know, different jewelry stores. It was just an amazing layover. It's one of my most memorable ones, as you can tell. And if you haven't been to Sedona, like you definitely have to check it out. I want to bring my mom there. I know she would love it too because they do wine tastings and yeah, it's just an absolutely, absolutely gorgeous place. I absolutely love Sedona. So yes, that is another memorable layover for me. Okay, at this point, I really need some more water. I am like dying over here from this story time. Whew. Can you tell I'm new to podcasting that I didn't bring enough water for me? <laughs> Anyways, we are getting towards the last three layovers here. I really hope you're enjoying it so far. This one... <laughs> This is still one of these like things that I like can't believe happened. So this layover was in Bermuda and it was interesting because it was a layover we weren't supposed to have. So basically myself and my coworker Gerard, who might be listening to this podcast, I actually really want to have him on as a guest at some point because he lives a very cool lifestyle. He hikes a lot. He's very much into nature. Um, I just think he would be a cool flight attendant to interview just because I think he lives a lifestyle different from most flight attendants. He's sober, he doesn't drink, and he has a very healthy lifestyle and just a very 
interesting, nice guy. So anyways, if he happens to be listening to this, this also was one of my most memorable layovers. And I wonder if it is for him too. But basically, we were on a multi-day trip. And the last day, this was the last day, it was a four-day trip that we were supposed to be starting pretty early, like at 4.45 in the morning from somewhere in Florida. I forget where we were. I forget where in Florida we were. We were Oh, sorry. Excuse me. We were somewhere in Florida and then had to fly back up to our base. And then we had sit time and then we were supposed to work a Bermuda turn. We don't ever get layovers in Bermuda. So any of the Caribbean islands, we usually typically do not get a layover for even Aruba, which is about a five hour flight from most of where my airline flies from. We as flight attendants do not get layovers there. We usually fly turns. So turns are where you fly there and you turn right around and you fly back. So we flew down to Bermuda and when we landed, we couldn't go back because our first officer, when she went to take oxygen, uh, because when pilots fly over water, they're supposed to be on oxygen a certain amount of time. I'm not sure exactly what their criteria is, but basically they're supposed to be on oxygen if they're flying over water. Her clips of her mask basically like broke apart. And so when we got down there, it was like a no-go to go back because her oxygen mask was broken. And since we weren't in a hub or a base, they didn't know if they had the parts. So as you can imagine, this was a very long day. If we were, it was, it was like, basically we were going to go what they say illegal. So basically we were going to time out and we weren't going to be able to work the flight back. Me and him, the other people that were on the trip was two other flight attendants that had picked the trip up um, or like was a different crew. Like basically like huh, it's, it could get scheduling can get just so complicated, but basically one of the other flight attendants we were working with, like the original guy we were working with, he got put off the trip because um, when we came back from Florida, like his device, his work device wasn't working. So he couldn't fly it anymore. So they replaced him. So it was someone different that was just starting. So they were legal to, work the the trip back basically and then it was someone else that picked up just the turn part of the trip because you can sometimes advertise trips that if they go back to base you could advertise trips (laughs) there's so much stuff I'm gonna have to talk about on this podcast there's this this whole career is so complex so I don't want to go too much into it but just know that only me and Gerard were the only ones that were gonna go illegal in timeout okay so I called scheduling because I was like, forget this. Like, they're sending a rescue flight down here. Basically, a rescue flight is where they send a flight down to take the passengers that are supposed to be coming back, back. And then obviously us, the crew, but we were timing out. And so the agents there in Bermuda were like, don't worry about it. Like, we'll find a hotel for you because this doesn't really happen that often. So we'll find the hotel for you. But in my head, I was like, I'm calling scheduling because like... They're supposed to be setting us up or whatever. So this was in August, okay, mind you. So I guess it was, I think it was August 2019. So yeah, it was like people were traveling, everything was busy. Um, And when I called scheduling, they had me on hold for over an hour trying to find us a hotel. And when they finally came back, they were like, okay, like, so sorry that took so long. We found you a hotel. It's called the Rosewood. So I didn't really know like what that meant or anything. Be- and plus, I was just tired. And it was there was all these like complications because we couldn't get off the aircraft because we couldn't clear customs unless like we were definitely going to be getting off the aircraft. And then meanwhile, only me and him were supposed to be getting off the aircraft, but we had to be escorted by an agent and there was no agents to be found. And so because we were stuck on the aircraft and so the pilot and the first officer and the other two flight attendants, they were going to be staying because they were waiting for this rescue flight to come and rescue them basically. Right. So finally we got an agent to take us off the aircraft. And I said to her, I was like, yeah, so I called scheduling and got a hotel and she like looked at me and she was like, 
oh, she's like, I would have, you know, I told you that I had a hotel for you, you know, because this never happens. Your crews never stay over here. In fact, I think that this is the first in company history that you are staying over here. And so like the islands are a little different because like it's people that are like outsourced that don't really actually work for our company. So like the agents like kind of work for all the airlines in the islands, if that kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, uh, it's, oh my gosh, everything's so complicated in this industry. But anyways, so she was like, oh yeah, like I've, you know, booked flight uh, hotels for flight attendants before that have stayed over here in other companies. So, you know, I would, I told you I got that for you. Well, where did they put you? And I was like, the Rosewood? And she, you guys, she lost her shit. She was like, the Rosewood? The Rosewood? Oh my God, you're staying at the Rosewood? Oh my God, I can't believe you're staying at the Rosewood. I can't, oh my God. So basically, it is like the nicest resort in Bermuda. <laughs> you guys, when I'm telling you this place was so dope, I had my own private cabana outside of my room at a pool like that was oceanfront and then Gerard his room was like a different style room but it, he, he his room like had like a nice balcony that like had like gardens around it and basically like his bed had like flowy drapey stuff over it you know what I mean like it was gorgeous like I cannot even explain it to you over a podcast like it was just so beautiful and it was so insane and it was the first time in our company history that anyone ever laid over there and so then here's the kicker we got to that hotel and I had taken the other flight attendant's phone number and she ended up texting me saying hey we're staying too because apparently the rescue flight then wasn't coming for like a really long time so they just decided to lay them over there too but we had taken the last two rooms at the Rosewood. You guys, seriously, like, it was so amazing. I think, like, the staff there thought we were, like, on a honeymoon or something. They kept trying to give us drinks, and we couldn't drink the next morning because we were flying back, even though we were deadheading back. Still, like, whatever. We, like, couldn't be drinking or whatever. Because I was, I think I was on reserve that month, too. So, like, it's different rules for if you're on reserve or if you're a line holder with deadheading. You know, if I was a line holder deadheading back, I would have been allowed to drink or something. Anyways, another really memorable layover that was just so insane. And if I ever have him on the show, like, I'm going to have him tell it from his perspective because it was just, it was just so cool. Like, I still to this day cannot believe the room I had. It was just gorgeous. The bathtub, the bathroom, it, it had like the standalone bathtub that was massive. Like, it was basically like the rooms go for $1,200 a night. So it's like an experience that I will probably never have again, unless I somehow become very rich very soon. You know what I mean? Like it was just one of those places. And to this day, the nicest hotel I've stayed at on a layover. Okay, up next, this was a Madrid, Spain layover. So I think it's actually the yeah, this is the second international layover. Most of the, or no, third. It's the third international layover. Most of them were domestic. So this this was a really memorable layover just because I picked this trip up randomly and it was the last trip that I worked before I became an instructor for my company. And so it was just really memorable to me because of the people I met. I had a really good crew and I met my friend Elsie, who is a fellow house head and she was a Spanish speaker and knew where to go in Madrid. And so she took myself and like three other girls or two other girls out. And we just had an amazing time because we had, you know, mutual friends that like she has friends of mine that I know through Groove Cruise and Burning Man and festivals and stuff like that. And we're both from New Jersey. So like we talked about the Brooklyn Mirage and, you know, all these clubs and stuff that we used to go to. And she's like an old school house head. So she's been around the scene for a long time. And so it was just like really cool that that trip brought us together. But not only that, it was just like 
a trip that I got to experience before I became an instructor. And then after I became an instructor, COVID kind of happened. And so this trip and the next trip I'm about to tell you, which is the last memorable layover, basically they were memorable, I think, because it was like they were those sandwich trips of before I was an instructor and after I was an instructor. But it was just really cool. Like Madrid, I had never been to. I love Barcelona. I've been to Ibiza. Like, you know, I really love Spain. And I really just enjoyed all the places she was taking us. We were eating all these delicious tapas and, you know, having delicious wine. And it was just a very enjoyable time for me, uh, especially because, like, right after that trip, I went through, like, a crazy breakup and um, became an instructor. And so it was just very memorable for me. All right, I will be back with the last layover. My camera's dying and I got to switch the battery out. All right, I'm back for this last layover, which was Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I really love Montana and Wyoming, you guys. Like, these states are so super dope. If you have not been out there and you're from the United States, you have to check it out. It is just so sick out there. But this was a trip that was after I became an instructor. I was working for my company as an initial training instructor, instructing new hire flight attendants. And I was living in another city doing that for the company for about three months. And so the last trip I had was the Madrid trip. And then the first trip I had back coming from being an instructor was this trip, which was a New Year's Eve trip. And it was to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And it was a part of my line. So I was a line holder and it was part of my line and I kept it because I had never been to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and it was a 24 hour layover on New Year's Eve. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, it was a pretty long day for me because I had flown, I did like a Raleigh turn before going out to Jackson Hole. So it was like I flew from Newark to Raleigh, back to Newark, and then picked up the crew members that were part of my trip that were going to be laying over in Jackson Hole with me. And it was just a really good crew. I don't really know how else to explain it, but it just is a memorable layover for me because the hotel was so cute. Like I have a picture of myself sitting on the stairs with all these poinsettias and like a big giant like deer in the background, like on the wall, you know. And it's a little ski town with a bunch of little shops that are completely adorable. And it was freezing but it was just so amazing. Like the crew I was with was really honestly just amazing. We went, you know, bar hopping and went shopping and went to dinner. And it was just a great trip. The first trip back since I had become an instructor. And it was so great. And and if I'm being completely honest with you, it was really the last trip before COVID happened for me that was something memorable like that because this was – New Year's going from 2019 to 2020. And after that trip, I went on Groove Cruise and I got really sick when I got back from Groove Cruise. And um, I really actually think I may have had COVID, but we just didn't know about COVID at that time. And so, yeah, and then basically COVID happened after that. Like I didn't work the entire month of January. That was the only trip I worked because I was so sick. And I basically just cleared my line because I was going on group cruise and, um, you know, then was sick. So I didn't work. And then February came along and I worked like a few trips, but it was like, I was actually just working to make hours, um, because I was planning on going to Envision Festival. Then I was going to Cross and like had all these festival plans. So like a lot of my trips were more like high time flying with not really layovers. And so, yeah, that was pretty much the last memorable trip that I had that was just so much fun and so cute. And I loved it and it was gorgeous. I love nature. And so, yeah, that's why it's in one of my top memorable layovers because I just, uh, I can't wait to get back to having those types of memories. Um, Actually, my first trip back last weekend, I had a great layover in Puerto Vallarta, but it wasn't supposed to happen. It was a very long day, and that ended up being a great layover with a great crew as well. So I'm really excited to have these experiences again, and I'm just really so happy that I have this job as my career. I 
have so many amazing memories through this job, through my company. I appreciate everything that my company has done for me, even though there's a lot of, I feel like, parts of my company I think need a lot of improvement. There's still a lot of things, especially after doing this entire podcast show that I love my company for. I love that they have given me this opportunity and these experiences. You know what I mean? So it's just absolutely amazing. And as you can tell, it obviously is amazing because I think this is going to be my longest podcast to date. I was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to fill it up just by going off memory, but clearly, clearly I can do that. Clearly I can talk a lot. All right, you guys, we still have aviation news to get into. So I'm going to take a quick break and I will be right back with aviation news. All right, fam, welcome back for Aviation News. Here are some headlines that I picked up this last week, starting off with some extremely exciting news for the future of aviation. So first up, we have that United Airlines is the first U.S. airline to invest in and sign an agreement for Boom Aero Overture Airlines, which are expected to be a net zero carbon aircraft connecting 500 plus cities in nearly half the time. You guys, if you're not watching on YouTube, my face just like totally lit up. This is so cool. So this is a boom supersonic aircraft that is designed for comfort and it flies at 60,000 feet. It's powered by 100% sustainable fuel. And honestly, this is just massive news for aviation in general. This is so exciting if this is where aviation is going because cutting flight time in half is insane. So they are projecting that a flight from London Heathrow or from New York City to London Heathrow is going to be about three hours and 30 minutes. Currently to get from New York City to Texas, that's how long it is. And currently if you're flying to London, it takes about six hours. So Cutting that time in half, they're saying it's going to be a four-hour flight from New York City to Frankfurt, a six-hour flight from San Francisco to Narita, and this is projected to take flight in 2029, which really, if you think about that, that is not too far away. That is in eight years, so that is completely insane and so exciting to think about. A lot of people are like, oh, it's eight years away. Think about your time as an adult and how fast everything has been moving. I'm telling you, I feel like that eight years is going to blow by and the technology we're about to see in aviation is going to be so amazing. So of course the chatter uh, is about all this. And even my mom said this, my mom said, wow, so are those crews going to be flying turns then? And that's kind of like what a lot of people in the aviation industry are talking about, because normally you would, you know, you could fly a turn to California. It would be a high time turn. But yeah. So now are you not going to lay over in London? Are you not going to lay over in Frankfurt? It's kind of kind of like, uh oh, uh oh, those were the fun layovers. Now they might be turns in these super sonic boom aircraft. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. We're just going to have to wait and see. But Yeah, I think that this is just a huge investment. And I think that once more companies invest in this technology, it's, it's going to be amazing. Like, it's going to be awesome. All right, up next for news, we have Alaska Airlines partners with Boeing for their Eco Demonstrator program. This was a program that was created in 2012 and initially designed to fast track innovation in fuel efficiency, noise reduction, and operational efficiency while readying technologies at a faster pace for aviation applications. Boeing has also collaborated with American Airlines, uh, Embraer, Ethiad, Ethiad Airways, sorry, <laughs> and now Alaska Air- Airlines. So a pretty cool program that Alaska just partnered with for Boeing. All right, so Airbus went live from their showroom the other day in Tuscelo to unveil their first full size A220 mock up. You could watch the full 32 minute video by visiting at Airbus or at Airbus Press on Twitter. 
Also, we have some exciting library coming from Spirit Airlines. They partnered with DreamWorks for a new movie called Spirit Untamed, which is a film that follows a girl on the frontier who meets a very fast but untamed horse. So look out for that Spirit Library with the distinctive red paint on the fuselage. Emirates just announced that they will launch a new nonstop route connecting Dubai and Miami starting July 22nd. Updates on the COVID vaccination in the United States. So obviously I'm throwing in some other news that is just not pertaining to aviation, but affects the aviation industry, as I said in previous episodes. So this is pretty important since I am from the United States and based in the United States. So These are some updates with COVID vaccinations. These are the states with the lowest percentage of people vaccinated that could face the biggest risk in order from lowest percentage vaccinated. So we have Mississippi. They have 34.3% that has received only one dose, followed by Louisiana, Alabama, Wyoming, Idaho, Tennessee, Arkansas, Georgia, West Virginia, and then South Carolina with 41%. Uh, There's also a bunch of states that were listed that are only at around 50%. I know Texas is one of them. So still a lot of states out there that are not down with the vaccination. Uh, Just thought it might be important for any travelers to keep in the back of their mind. I think Florida was another one that was only about 50%. So yeah, just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, And closing out this segment for this week, we have some great news from Southwest Airlines. Not great news, but a nice story. Um, It's kind of one of those bittersweet stories, but way better than the flight attendant that got punched in the face, right? (laughs) So I'm happy to see stories like this from Southwest. So a gate agent noticed a customer carrying a folded flag during boarding and learned that the passenger was on her way home from the funeral service of her brother, who was a fallen Air Force pilot. So obviously that is very sad. That is not great news. But after learning about the story, the crew decided to fly the flag in a place of honor in the cockpit. So they have a story on their social networks showing that the flag was flown by the pilot controls in the cockpit. So I thought that was a really beautiful story and a great way to honor this service member. And once again, thank you to all of our military personnel out there. We do appreciate everything that you do. Uh, you know, I, I know that I personally, I always say this all the time, like I don't, I don't think I could do it. So I, I really respect all of our military out there and uh, thank you all men and women. And of course, uh, condolences to this Folin uh, Air Force pilot. And that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I had so much fun with this episode or episodes, you guys, like I was not expecting it to be a two part episode. So I just like am hoping you enjoyed it as much as me. As you can tell, I love telling stories and I love talking. That's why podcasting is probably the best platform for me. (laughs) Clearly, I'm still getting used to timing. I have said before that I want to keep my shows at 30 minutes to an hour. So depending on the topic, that will depend on what and how much time I I spend on the shows. So thanks so much for tuning in. Don't forget to submit your most memorable layovers to me at radio at livingbythefword.com. And I will see you in the next episode. Bye.